Church, it's so good to be with you. My name is AJ. If we have not had the chance to meet, I'm one of the pastors here on staff, and it's wonderful to be with you this morning. How are we feeling this morning? Are we doing good? Feeling blessed in the house? Praise God. Praise God. Um, we just got back uh, this weekend from uh, Every Nation Conference in Orlando. Every Nation, if you don't know, is the global family of churches of which Grace Covenant is a member of. We partner with churches all over the world and consider ourselves one spiritual family. And every few years we get together as church leaders, as staffs, um, as churches, church planters for a time of encouragement, impartation, and really probably the best part is just seeing your spiritual family from all over. And so this last week we were down in Orlando, that's where all of our pastors and many of our ministers were, which is why nobody was around for you, and hopefully everything went well. I heard it was fine, so praise God. Um, But it was a really good moment. I wanted to give you a brief just report out from that, because this is a time where we get to be reminded that as a movement and as a people, we are called to reach the campus and the next generation. We're called to do that through discipleship. It is a core value of who we are. We are a movement and a people who develop leaders and access and find the gift that God has given you and the calling to which he has called you. And we help you walk in that. And we are reminded that we are not a church community that is satisfied just reaching our local area, but we are a church community that is called to reach the nations in the world. So we get this moment with all of our North American leaders to gather together, to get fresh vision, to worship together, to pray together for one another, to see our spiritual family, to leave really encouraged and really full. And so we were all really excited Friday morning to head back to church and all the airlines shut down. We got some people still on their way back today. So uh, we pray that they make it and uh, we trust that they will. God's favor shined upon us and we were able to get out on our flight on Saturday, but it's good to be back. And I just wanna take a moment to honor and thank the staff and leaders who stayed behind this past week and kept things running as they do. They did a phenomenal job and we are grateful for every single one of them. They deeply, deeply matter to us. I'm gonna continue the series that we started last week called Soul Care. The heart of this series is the idea that we don't just want to go far in life, but we want to go deep in life. And we believe that what happens on the inside of us directly, what hap- uh, directly affects what happens on the outside of us. And far too many of us are overly consumed with outward appearances because those are things that are easy to manipulate. And far fewer of us invest deeply in the inner man. And yet Jesus tells us that there is no benefit for you to gain the whole world if it costs you your soul. So your soul matters deeply to Jesus and it matters deeply to us and I hope that it matters deeply to you. The framework around which we're kind of developing this series is the the idea that the soul is made up of the mind, the will, and the emotions. Or in other words, the head, the heart, and the hands. And So today we're gonna be talking about what happens in that head of yours, which is scary territory for some of us. But we're gonna do it together, amen? Amen. Why don't we stand for the reading of the word of God? This is Philippians 4. We're going to read verses 8 and 9. Philippians 4, verses 8 and 9. This is the word of the Lord. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely and whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, Think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we invite you into this space today, Lord, asking that you would grant us a revelation, a revelation of what is latching hold to us and a revelation of what you offer to us, the freedom that is available. Father, I'm asking that you would give us eyes to see and ears that would hear and a heart that could understand what the spirit of the living God is saying to us in this place on this day, I pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said amen. Amen. You can be seated. It feels churchy in here all of a sudden. I don't know what. I don't know what. My guy. Okay. You pray. Yeah, well, all right. Now I'm all distracted. All right. Um, So this last week we were in Florida with our Every Nation family and one of the things I love about Grace Covenant Church, one of the things that really drew me to this place when I first started coming a couple decades ago and what really helped me with uh, getting a global vision was the idea that we as a church are committed 
to being a multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-generational, multi-generational expression of the kingdom of God. That we're not content building churches that look like us, but we want to build a church that looks like heaven. And for me growing up, getting to experience and encounter the manifold wisdom of God revealed to us through the many nations, the many cultures, the many upbringings, the many backgrounds, and the many expressions of faith has been such a rich and rewarding experience for me because it's it's really broadened my horizons as I've learned to encounter and interact with God, and I'm so deeply grateful for that. One of the things that I learned a lot about this last year that I did not grow up knowing a lot about was something called the testimony service. Does anybody grow up going to testimony service in the house? I need to know what I'm working with. Okay, there's quite a few of you. So if you don't know by looking at me, I did not grow up going to testimony service. (laughs) The church that I grew up in, I would describe as vanilla in its orientation. But I'm around some amazing people who grew up in this atmosphere and they've taught me about it. And if you don't know, uh, testimony service is kind of like an open mic night where you're able to get up and share about the goodness of God, how he's blessed you, how he's been faithful to you. And it's just your chance to testify, amen? So I was was talking to uh, J.C. Stevenson, who is a walking testimony service. If you have ever met him, he, he has not left the testimony service he was last in. He carries it, he carries it with him. And so <laughs> he was teaching me about this and explaining it to me. And if I can be honest, I have one minor critique of a testimony service. I'm not going to be critical or anything, but I just, you, the bar is set pretty low at testimony service. Is that fair to say? Like, you don't need to have saved somebody, you don't need to have a healing, you don't need a financial miracle, you just need to be alive and breathing, and that's enough to have a testimony service, right? <laughs> so, I talked to JC and I said, you know, what, what's common to hear at testimony service night? And he said, you might hear something that sounds a little bit like this. First, I'd like to give glory and honor to God who is the head of my life. <laughs> for if it had not been for the Lord who has been on my side, I don't know where I'd be today. But I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen. And then you might give glory and honor to God. You might give honor to the bishops and the first lady, Miss Cynthia Fuller. And you might want to honor the pastors and the under shepherds of the house and the ministers and the deacon and honor the ones that serve you. And then you might just hear somebody say something like, I'd like to thank God this morning for waking me up because I could have been dead in my bed, sleeping in my grave. But he sought to wake me up and clothe me in my right mind. He put food on my table and clothes on my back and he made a way for me to come into the house of the Lord today. So I just want to testify that I'm grateful. Does anybody have a testimony this morning that God woke you up? He put fresh breath in your lungs. You got a pulse in your chest, clothes on your back, food on your table. Can anybody testify to the fact that God is not done with you yet? Otherwise, he would have brought you home. Does anybody have a testimony this morning of how good God is? Because he woke you up and he clothed you in your right mind. Amen. Hallelujah. Hey, hey. Come on. And now I know what I was missing all them years. Singing how great is our God four, five, six times a service. Listen, listen. You're going to need to cut that out, Ronnie. We're going to have problems today. (laughs) We're going to be here till next week. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. There's one line in there that I never once in my life ever thought I needed to thank God for. I take God, I don't take God for granted. I know every day I get a fresh 24 and I use it for the glory of God. I do not take every day that I wake up for granted. If God gave me today, today is all I've got. I'm gonna use today for my God in every way that I can. But never once in my life did I ever think I would have to thank God for waking me up in my right mind. I don't know if that says more about you or more about me, I don't know. But I never thought about it. And JC is telling me, man, this is common. This is what we testify every day. He clothed me in my right mind. And 
So I began to think about it, began to meditate on it, and I realized what it felt like the last time I lost my mind. And I realized what it felt like the last time I was dealing with somebody who was out of their mind. I've got a three-year-old. He's lost his mind more than he's found it, okay? So I get, if I say, God, don't wake me up, but could you wake him up in his right mind? Please, Lord. And that's when I began to realize that perhaps the greatest gift God could give us on any given day is waking us up in our right minds. And maybe the greatest gift we could give back to God is to use our minds to think about that which is true and lovely and pure and honorable. Paul, in his letter to the Philippians, which is what we're reading today, we read chapter four. But back in chapter two, he's admonishing and teaching that there is a way we can go through life, not with our mind, but with the mind of Christ. He says, you ought to have this mind amongst yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And what Paul is doing is, is he's layering this thought that there is a way that you can act, think, and operate that is just like the way that Jesus acted and thought and operated. And that way is not far off from us. It's not distant from us. In fact, it is available to each and every one of us who call upon the name of the Lord. You can have the mind of Christ. And perhaps the mind of Christ is our best mind and is our right mind. And Paul says, you you have it. You phroneo, that's the Greek word. It means to set your mind upon it. Or in other words, change the way you think to begin to think like he thought. We have access to the mind of Christ. And Paul wants us to lean in and find it and get it. And so at the close of of his letter, he says, look, there are some things that you can think about. There are some thoughts I want you to hold in your mind. And to hang on to every day of your life. Because if you do, the God of peace will be with you. The Bible knows and teaches us that our thoughts are of utmost importance. Because as our thoughts go, so our emotions follow. As our beliefs go, so go our faith. As our mind goes, so go the actions of our hands because the things we believe become the things that we do. And perhaps the greatest battle you will fight every day of your life is the battle that rages in your mind. So I want to talk about three types of thoughts this morning. I want to talk about thoughts that we hold on to. I want to talk about thoughts that hold on to us. And I want to talk about thoughts that bring us peace. There are some thoughts that we hold on to. And often it is not the thoughts we think that lead to the freedom we're looking for, but the thoughts that we let go of. Thoughts that we hold on to are thoughts that we don't even know that we believe. We're not even consciously, actively aware that we're thinking them. But somewhere along the line, they were formed in our soul and we have not let go of them. Here's the bottom line I want to give you on this point. I'll write it down now. We'll come back to it at the end. You are in control of your mind. Your mind is not in control of you. The ultimate freedom that you have as a human being is the power to direct where your thoughts dwell. That is a power that you have. You are in control of your mind. Your mind is not in control of you. But what gets hard is when there are thoughts and beliefs we're holding on to that we're not aware we've been holding on to. Things that are rotting away at us from the inside. Things that maybe happened in childhood or happened in the family or the culture that we grew up in that formed an identity within us. And that's the way by which we see the world now. Maybe we had a bad experience, a bad encounter, and we learned a lesson. Man, life taught us a lesson. And we just have applied that lesson as a universal truth for the rest of our lives. And we've not consciously or actively thought it, but it has formed every decision that we make. I'll give you a couple of examples just to bring this to color here for us. You might have a scarcity mindset. Scarcity mindset is often found in people who didn't have a lot growing up, and so they are consumed with a fear that they will one day lose all that they have. So their whole life is spent worrying about what they don't have instead of thanking God for what they do have. So no matter, they're usually very successful. They've achieved in career, they've earned a lot of money, they've acquired a lot of things, but they cannot see beyond what they have, they can only see what what they don't have, and so they have a hard time celebrating others' success because all they can see is that they didn't earn that same success. And there's a gap in their soul that that doesn't allow them to experience the joy and the contentment that God offers to them because there's some belief that they've held on to that they just need a couple more 
things. Maybe you have a, a helpless mentality. Helpless mentality says, the situation that I am in won't change no matter what I do. I've tried before, it didn't work, why try again? If something's gonna change here, somebody else has to do it. I am helpless to have any impact on what goes on here. And this is a real one, especially when you talk about relationship, where one party is really trying to turn things around and really trying to help the marriage and help the relationship. And they feel like, man, everything I've tried to do hasn't done anything, so I'm gonna stop trying. I might have a helpless mentality. You might have a victim mindset. In most cases in my life, I am the victim. The problems that I face, the challenges that I'm up against, and the reason that I am not where I want to be is somebody else's fault. And if they would do, or if they would stop, or if they could see, or if they would whatever, then I could finally. But I am subject and a victim to all of those around me. I didn't do anything wrong. They're the problem. And it holds you back in life and keeps you from moving forward. These beliefs, we can hold on to them because of our cultural upbringing, because of the family, because of the parents that we have. It could come from traumatic experiences. Listen, if you were bully or bullied or abused or neglected, you might have deep issues with your self-image. And you might hold on to a belief that says, I know what I've done. I know what's been done to me. I know where I have been. And there is no reason anybody could or should love me. And that means God too. And even though he calls you beloved, there's just a louder thought that you hold on to that says, but I know myself. I'm not worthy of love. See, these thoughts, they creep in. They sneak in. And we grab hold of them. And then do you know what they begin to do for us? They begin to shape our reality. They begin to shape how we see and interact with the world. They become the thing by which we build our entire identity and belief system around. It is like the scaffolding of our life that gets formed and set up because of what happened to us when we were younger or things that we've seen or learned along the way. And every area of our life begins to be touched and marked and influenced by these thoughts that we won't let go of. Now, many of us are not even consciously aware of them until one day we kind of bump up against it or somebody calls it out, in a, 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 a calls it out in us or, or somebody uh, uh, speaks about it and you go, man, that's, I, think that might be, I think that might be me and our instinct is to suppress that, push that down, not go there, not look at it and just move forward. Man, if I just keep moving, if I just keep going, if I just keep running my race, so I just, I'll deal with that some other day. I don't have time today. But can I just tell you, If the building is structurally unsound, no amount of wallpaper or paint is gonna do a darn thing about it. It's gotta be torn down and rebuilt. You've gotta raise it to the ground and rebuild a new structure on the inside. The work of therapists and many of our pastors and ministers is to do this exact type of work with you because you have grabbed hold of a fallen idea system and you've built the framework of your life around it. And you are standing on shaky ground. And the work, again, of a therapist or a pastor is to spend time helping to uncover those beliefs that you're holding on to and begin to loosen your grip on them so that they can fall by the wayside and we could stand something up that is much more permanent and much more beneficial for you. If we want to be a people who are healthy in our souls, if we want to be a people who live every day in our right minds, then we've got to begin to acknowledge our fallen idea systems. We need to repent of them, which means to get a new view on it, to see it differently, to turn from believing one thing and start believing another thing. Some of us need to to renounce it, to come out of agreement with it. I no longer believe that. I will not submit to that. I am breaking off my agreement with this so that I stop believing the lies of life and have room to start believing the truth of God. The only way out of this is to have the mind of Christ about you. And I've got great news. That mind is available to you, amen? So if you wanna be in your right mind, you gotta stop lying to yourself. You gotta stop holding on to beliefs that are holding you back. You've got a scarcity mindset. The Bible says that my God will supply every single one of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. You feel like the victim? The Bible says no. 
In all of these things, we are more than conquerors through the one who loves us. You feel helpless? God would remind you, do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. God will fight your battle. You only need be still. Pastor LaFoon this past week, he said, you know, we've started this tradition or really brought back this tradition of standing for the reading of the word, which is a great thing and we love that. It honors the authority of the word in our life. But we must not let standing for the word replace standing on the word. We need to build our lives on the word of God, not just honor it as a book that looks nice. We need to build it as the foundation under which the scaffolding of our life is put upright. There's a belief that you're holding on to that is limiting you, that is keeping you from God. You've got to tear it down, renounce it, break agreement with it so that you can stand on the word of God. You not only can do this, church, you must do this. You control your mind. It does not control you. Some of us have been far too satisfied with our own levels of dysfunction that we will not come out of what was and step into the freedom that Christ has for us. And I'm just saying, on the other side of that healing is a better life. It's a freer life. It's a more joy-filled, it's a more generous life. And you want to experience it. The mind of Christ is available to you. What would it look like if you grabbed hold of that and let go of the thoughts that you've been holding on to? Secondly, there are some thoughts that we're not holding on to, but thoughts that are trying to hold on to us. These are the thoughts that come into our mind uninvited. They try to take up residency there. They grab hold and they try not to let go. And what I want you to get from this point is this. Your mind is not a neutral territory. Your mind is a battlefield. It is a war zone. There is a lot that is happening in that space every day and every night that you may or may not be aware of. And perhaps the most important battlefield on which you fight every day is the one that happens between your two ears and the voices that you're battling and the thoughts that you're battling. Listen, your mind is a powerful thing. It is incredibly powerful. All of the advancements in science, technology, academia, in art, literature, social justice, humanitarian aid, all of the great things that humanity has accomplished all began as an idea. It all started in someone's mind. What if we, I wish we could, how can we, and from the thought life of great men and great women, our society can and has been transformed for the better. But hear me, every hateful action, every act of racism and prejudice, every act of corruption, Every fear, every insecurity, every self-damaging belief, they also start as thoughts that were left unattended to, unaddressed, and left to grow wild all on their own. What I'm saying is your mind is powerful. It can produce great good and great evil. So we cannot neglect what is happening in our minds because they have pow- it has the power to form and shape the reality before us. And don't think for one minute that the devil doesn't know this. Listen, when the devil sought to draw Eve away from God, he didn't hit her with a rock, he hit her with an idea. Did God really say, you won't surely die. God knows what will happen if you actually eat the fruit. It was the whisper of a voice of an enemy that hated her, that Eve let grab hold of her. She began to believe it, and it began to change the way that she saw God. And she started to entertain an alternate reality where God was dishonest and unfaithful and cruel. And in her mind, she believed the thought that was presented to her, and it led to her demise. And I need you to know That is the same game plan the devil uses today to pull you out of the grace of God. He is trying to insert ideas in your mind that cause you to doubt, to fear, and to question the goodness of God. Did he really say? And the crazy thing is that his words sound good sometimes. Let's just be honest. <laughs> the devil is not a fool out here going like, hey, man, you know what you should do? You should cheat on your wife. That'll be really good for you. You know what you need? You need a gambling addiction. Yeah, bro, that's what you need to lose all your money. The devil's not a fool. 
and you're not a fool. So he doesn't speak directly to the things that should break us. He says things like, you deserve better than this. You're not appreciated here. You'd be more valued somewhere else. You deserve it. You should have a good life, man. God, God came to give you a good life. Enjoy life. Enjoy the freedom of life. God, God would love for you to just be in, enjoying the goodness of life. One preacher said the devil is like a wicker chair. His words are like a wicker chair. There's a strand of truth wrapped up in a whole lot of lie. And he speaks to the part of our flesh that is corrupted. And he says the things we want to hear. You guys ever have that friend who asks like, 10 people for advice until he gets the one who agrees with him. <laughs> and everybody is like, no, no, no. And then one person doesn't really know him. is like, I guess. And they're like, see? <laughs> you know, I was talking to so-and-so today. They made a really good point. There's a part of our flesh that desires these things. There's a part of our pride that wants to be fed and fueled. There's a part of us that wants to be justified in the earth. Like, I do deserve it. I ought to be treated better. Die to myself. I don't want to die to myself. That's not fair. Nobody died for me. It's a little truth wrapped up in a whole lot of lie. And the greatest con men are great not because they get you to believe a lie, but they get you to tell yourself a lie that you want to believe. This is how the devil operates to this very day. He speaks to your flesh. He speaks to the broken part of you and the hurting part of you. And he says, you are in pain. You know what would make you feel better? When people ask me, how do I know if I'm hearing from the Lord? I've been praying. I've been asking God. I've been reading my Bible. How do I know if I'm hearing his voice? Do you know what I tell them? I say more often than not, the voice of God is going to be the voice telling you to do the thing you don't want to do. You know what you need to do? You need to go back in there. You need to have that conversation and you need to forgive them. Oh, I definitely don't want to do that. Anybody else? <laughs> Any other opinions in the room here? Any other? It's the voice that says, you know what, you got you to hold on to your faith a little bit longer. I know it's hard. I know persevering is so painful. I know it's not fun, but son, daughter, I'm with you in it. Just hold on to me, and I'll hold on to you. And you're going like, oh, I don't I want to get out of it now, though. We're looking for a voice sometimes that will speak to our flesh because we feel like we'll find freedom there, but there is no life there. Eve did not find life when she ate the fruit. Eve was not made to be like God when she believed the lie. It led to her destruction. The thoughts the enemy whispers into your ear do not lead to life. He hates you. You were made in the image of God to be redeemed in the earth so that you could fellowship with the one. He hates that about you because he lost that opportunity and he wants to take it from you as well. Your mind is not neutral. It is a battlefield. That's why Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 10, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal in nature. They're not of the flesh and the blood. The weapons of our warfare have a divine power that can break down strongholds. So you know what we do? We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion that is raised against the knowledge of God. We take every thought captive and we make it obedient to Jesus Christ. This is the path of the believer. When thoughts flash before us, and let me just tell you for a moment, you are not defined by the thoughts that you have. You're defined by what you do, not by what you think. Thoughts are like cars passing on the road. Just because they're passing through your mind doesn't mean you need to jump into every one of them. Sometimes the greatest thing you can do is step back and let it go. Watch it, goodbye, no thank you, and let the thought pass. Some of us, have, we, man, the culture, our culture today has put so much emphasis and weight on thoughts and emotions. We've elevated them to the level of fact and reality. If you think it, so then it is true. Follow your heart. It is real to you. It's real. And just psychology, unsaved psychology would tell you that is not true. They're called intrusive thoughts for a reason. Chemical imbalances in the mind that, that bring to mind things that are, that are wicked, that are crazy, that are evil. 
Just because you think it doesn't mean it's true about you. It doesn't mean you have to engage with it. Paul is teaching us, the Bible is showing us, when it flashes through your mind, you know what you do? You bring it to Jesus. You go, Lord, is this from you or is this from me? And if it's from him, man, believe it, pursue it, ask him to bless it, stand on it, chase after it. But if it's from you, I'll say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'll redeem that part of me that comes up with that. Change my heart, Lord. Change, change my mind. I don't, I don't want to have, have thoughts like that. Your mind is not a neutral territory. It cannot be left unattended. Because the devil is working to whisper things into your ear that will change the way you see God, change the way you interact with others. We must be vigilant to take those thoughts captive, to bring them to Jesus and ask him to direct us. What if you let your mind be Christ's territory? What if you let it become his battlefield where he would go and he would fight for you? I wonder if you might not begin to see the renewal of the mind that's talked about in Romans 12. And look, this is easier said than done. There's no doubt about it. I don't know anybody that has fully mastered what I'm talking about. Most people are fighting this battle every day of their life. You get better at it. You get faster at it. You begin to notice your blind spots. But the reality of this is is changing the direction that your mind goes. Waging war on the battlefield of your mind is not easy, but it is good. Part of coming out of the kingdom of darkness and a life of sin and selfishness and into the kingdom of God, into a life of light and righteousness requires parts of you to be wrenched off, to be pulled off, to be separated from. And you've got to fight that every day of your life to not go back into what you were. It doesn't mean God didn't save you. It means the battle's not over yet and that there's more for you here in the earth. It's not easy, but it is good. Lastly, there are thoughts that bring us peace. If the devil's game plan is to get us to believe thoughts about God that are untrue and therefore change the way we see him so that we begin to doubt and disobey him, then our game plan has to be to capture those thoughts, reject them, and fill our minds with the true thoughts about God. This is how we get rid of all of the noise and the confusion and the distraction of our lives and can have a mind that is at peace I don't know if you're like me, but you just feel like every day there's so much noise. There's so many opinions, so many perspectives, so many problems, so many challenges, so much confusion. And I just, what I would give, you know the feeling when you put on noise-canceling headphones and the world just tunes out. Spiritually, sometimes I feel like we need that, that moment with the Lord. And we allow the peace of God. This is what Paul is saying. He's saying, he's saying if you want the God of peace, to be with you, then you need to fill your mind with thoughts about him. Isaiah says, in Isaiah 26, you keep him, the Lord keeps you in perfect peace when your mind is stayed on him because it means that you trust him. Evidence of the mistrust of God is to say, here God, just kidding, I'll take it, and here's what you could do, and also this thing, and here's the other thing I'm worried about, and here's that, and here's this, and Lord, also this, and also that, but I got it, and you got it. That is not a mind that is stayed on the Lord. And it is evidence that, God, I don't, I don't really trust you. But the evidence of my trust in the Lord, the source of my peace in the earth, is to bring things to my God and trust him with them. And so Paul says, you want to have the God of peace be with you? Fill your mind with thoughts about him. Because he is the only one who is always true. He is the only one who is always honorable. He's the only one who is always just and always pure and always lovely and always commendable. He is the only one who is always excellent and he is the only one who is always worthy of praise. And if you want the God of peace to encounter you, spend time thinking about him. Dallas Willard once said, all of humanity's problems come from thinking wrongly about God. We've got a skewed vision of who he is and how he operates. And I would add to that, many times it's not just that we're thinking wrongly about God, but we're not thinking about him at all. So King David, in all of his mess, in all of his challenges, in all that he went through in his life, he writes in Psalm 16, I have set the Lord always before me. And because he is at my right hand, 
I will never be shaken. What a picture that gives us for life. What is your mind set on? David is saying, I've set the Lord before me, before my ambition, before my desire, before what I want in this life. I've set him before me. I've set him before my anxieties and my fears and my concerns and my doubts. I've set the Lord ahead of everything. He sits at the head of my life. I've set him there. I have placed him there. And because he is with me, here at my my right hand, there's nothing in this world that can shake me. Paul says, if you fix your mind upon the things of God, the God of peace will be with you. I am all for all of the therapeutic means that we have developed as a culture, as a society, as an academic field. I believe more, than, more of us than not need time with a therapist. I just believe that. It's not a shot or a shade at anybody, but there's just so much we don't know about ourselves. I am, I am for that, and all of that must be set on the foundation of a right belief about who God is. It's got to be. He's got to be the anchor that holds it all together because your thought life is the foundation of your life. It informs your emotions and it impacts what you do. So what is your mind set on? As David said, I set my mind on the Lord. As Isaiah wrote, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. As Paul wrote, think on the things that are lovely and just and pure and commendable and honorable and the God of peace will be with you. The picture that I'm getting is the more time that I spend thinking about God, the more time that I spend grabbing hold of the ideas of God, the more I realize that God begins to grab a hold of me. And my mind is not filled with the worries and the anxieties of the world. My mind is filled with the beauty and the glory of God. And when your mind is filled with the beauty and the glory of God, you are helpless but to begin to worship him. And worship is the place of greatest personal transformation. What God does when you begin to neglect the world and reject yourself and deny yourself and humble yourself and exalt him and look at him and see him, man, faith begins to rise. Healing comes upon you. A word of encouragement and knowledge comes. Your worries begin to worry, uh, drift away. Your anxieties begin to fall by the wayside. When you exalt him, you begin to be filled with a peace that surpasses our very ability to understand it. So what is your mind set on? This is my clothes. This is it. I'll tell you what mine is set on. My mind is set upon the reality that God loves me so much more than he dislikes all of the wrong things that I have ever done or will ever do. He loves me more than that. If you're a parent, you, you know what that feeling is a little bit. I always love my sons. I know they'll do wrong. I know they've done wrong. But I'll, but I'll always love them. My mind, is, my mind is filled with the thought of a God who so deeply and so unendingly loves me that he's forgiven every wrong thing I've ever done and every wrong thing I will ever do. My mind is settled on the thought that he came to the earth as Jesus and he died so that I could live because the wages of sin are death and I owed a debt to the Lord and Jesus paid the debt for me. My mind is fixed on the fact that there has to be a love that I have not yet fully understood and that love must be directed at me for God to do all of this for me. God gave me a second chance at life, and I have no intentions of wasting it. So my mind is stayed on the fact that the love of God saves me, transforms me, redeems me, and gives me my identity. I have set the Lord always before me. And because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. And my inner life is strengthened. The wrong beliefs I held on to, they don't feel so strong anymore. The thought patterns that I always fall back into, I don't fall back into them as much anymore. Because I'm anchored and rooted on the one who loved me and went to the ends of the earth for me. I've got to know him. I've got to know him more. And my friends, that love that he's shown me, 
It's the same love that he shows you. It's the same love that's available to you today. What will we look like as a people? What would your life look like if there were some old thought patterns that you released? If you waged war on the voice of the devil who comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and you grabbed hold of the mind of Christ, set him ahead of you, and allowed him to guard your heart and your mind and your hands and all that you do and all that you are. Let's pray. Lord God, we love you, maker of heaven and earth, author of our story. God, the one who knit us together in our mother's womb. God, you who have plans to bless us, to prosper us, not to harm us. You, Lord, who promised to be with us all the days of our life, Lord, we love you too. And Father, in this moment, we consecrate our minds to you. Consecrate just means we set it aside for a specific purpose. And Lord, today, we set our minds aside to be used for you and by you. God, where we have held on to belief systems of the world, sinful ideas, things that have, that have held us back in life and kept us from you, Lord, in this moment, we repent. And if that's you today, let's take a moment before we go here to do business with the Lord. As I said before, repent just means to have a new view on the issue, a new view on yourself. It means to turn from believing one thing and begin to believe another. And so, Lord, where we have held on to beliefs that are not of you, we repent. And we say, forgive us. We break agreement with the Lord. We are not helpless. We are yours. We are not victims. We are, we are conquerors. If you feel like you're not enough, the Bible would say greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. So the you that's in the world ain't that much, but the God that is in you is enough. And so Jesus, we break agreement with the thoughts that say we're unlovable, we're not good enough, we're not what we need to be, and we receive the peace of God that says you are enough for me. God, help us to stand on the truth of the word of God. Help us, Holy Spirit, to wage war in our minds that it would not become passive territory, God, but it would become a place of victory for us. Give us the vision, God, of what it would look like to be free of the things that wage war in our minds. Oh, Holy Spirit, without you, we can do no good thing, but with you, all things are possible. If you're here today and you've never made a decision to follow Jesus and to trust him with your life, in other words, you've never taken a moment to repent of your sin, to ask God for forgiveness, and to make a personal declaration that says Jesus is going to be the Lord of my life and the Savior of my soul. And you feel like the Holy Spirit is prompting you to do that this morning. If that's you and you're here, would you just raise your hand so I can see you? I just want to pray with you for a moment. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. I see those hands. Praise God, I see that hand. Once it's up, you can put it down. And if that's you in the room today, would you just pray this prayer with me? And if you're here, and maybe you prayed this prayer a long time ago, you made this decision a long time ago, but you never bore the fruit of it, and today you're saying, no, today I am going to get back right with God. If that's you, just pray this prayer with me. Say, God, forgive me for the life of sin that I've lived apart from you. God, I repent. I turn. I change. I want to change. I want to follow you every day of my life. Jesus, I'm saying that I believe in you. I believe you are God. I believe you walked the earth. I believe you died on a cross and it was in your death that allowed for the forgiveness of my sins. I believe that you were buried in a tomb and I believe that three days later you rose again. I believe your spirit is available to me today to transform me from the inside out. So Father, forgive me, make me new and make me like you. And help me, Holy Spirit, to follow you every day of my life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Say amen.
And can we give God praise for those who prayed that prayer this morning?